Good afternoon. Let me introduce myself. I'm Sandra Reyes and I collaborate in the training center at LACNIC. Before we start with the webinar, let me introduce Mary Jo Mata, our special guest. Let me tell you how we're going to work. The name is uh, when a future jobs uh, turn into today's jobs. So the session will be entirely in English, so it's important for you to know that we have a simultaneous translation and transcription into English, Portuguese, and English. You'll be able to locate this tool at the bottom of the toolbar um, and in, in the globe. The, the webinar will uh, uh, last uh, 60 minutes and you'll be able to ask questions about the presentation in the option in the Q&A option. And, uh, when we finish with the presentation, Mary Jo will answer any questions you may have. Finally, let me remind you that this webinar will be recorded and later on we'll share the link with the recording so that you can play it later. Without further ado, let me give the floor to my colleague, Alessia Succhetti, coordinator of um, research and cooperation projects who will introduce the webinar. Alessia, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this webinar that uh, is uh, who we will discuss how to get ready for an economy that is evolving rapidly. Mary Jo um, Mada, Senior Project Management in Google, will give us elements to face the current uh, uh, challenges and uh, the social and technological changes that uh, have an impact on the future of work, of labor, and how we can adapt to this scenario. Since this webinar is one of the activities focusing on women and technology organized by LACNIC, we're also going to discuss some of the challenges facing women as they participate in labor uh, market, especially in the IT sector. So thank you all for participating. And now, Mary Jo, you have the floor. Hola, everyone. Buenas tardes. Um, my Spanish is malo, so I will be giving this keynote in English. Um, but just so you know, I'm very, very thrilled to be here. I'm very excited. And I'm going to share my screen, but I do want to encourage anyone who has questions. I want to make sure that I have plenty of time for questions at the end of this. So if you do have questions, put them in the chat and let's talk about them because I definitely wanna make sure that we get to every single question that folks may have. So today I'm going to be talking about when jobs of the future become jobs of the present. I think that everyone can attest to the fact that right now the economy is going through a lot of ups and a lot of downs. And that's basically just been the way that we've been experiencing life for a number of years. I am thrilled to talk a little bit about my own background because I do think that it's important to kind of offer a bit of context around my own experiences and my own passage as somebody who works for Google, but also someone who's been in the tech space for a number of years. So I'm going to share a little bit of sort of insights into how I got into Google. Um, I first started my career out as a teacher. I was always interested in teaching science and math, especially to youth. It's been something that I've been incredibly passionate about for many, many years. And so when I first got started out, I actually ended up bringing in a lot of computer science education into my classrooms. Um, if you're familiar with this, this is Scratch. It is a uh, introductory computing language that's meant to get students interested in understanding the basics of computational thinking, loops, variables, and all the different ways that you take different components and fit them together to create and make a program run. Um, that being said, when I was in the midst of teaching, I also saw a lot of both good and poor implementation of technology in the classroom. And I remember thinking to myself, my third year of teaching, there's got to be a better way to figure out how to implement tech in learning and in really any industry in general. And so following that, I actually ended up becoming a journalist, but my focus was technology and technology implemented in education. 
I moved to San Francisco, the Bay Area, which many would argue is the hub of technology in the United States. And I became a journalist. I wrote about everything related to technology and education from how to implement one-to-one -one devices to Wi-Fi access and infrastructure to understanding why some venture capitalists fund some ed tech companies, but not others. And it was a pretty incredible experience. I'm not gonna lie to you. Um, but it was also quite challenging because a lot of questions I got from folks are were related to this question of how do I make sure that I always have skill sets that are relevant to the world, no matter what turns the economic and major industries and power end up taking. I actually do still write, if you'll notice on the date, this says June 11th, 2021, and that's because I am still writing up until this day. Um, in my current work, I have observed a lot of the ups and downs of tech from the corporate sector, working at Google, but also sort of from my vantage point in what I do now, which brings me to, oh, and I actually wanted to make one note. One of my biggest pet peeves about keynote presenters is when they have so much text on the slide that you don't know whether you should be reading the slide or listening to the presenter. So I want to make sure that everybody keeps me honest. If you notice that I'm doing too much reading off of the slide, please don't hesitate to tell me because that is one of my pet peeves as a learner. I don't think it's good necessarily for your mind when you're trying to both read text and listen. Those two things counterbalance or counteract each other. So just as a heads up, please call me out on that. But yeah, that brings us to where I am today. So I have been at Google since September 2017, and I have been in a lot of really interesting capacities, but they all come into one theme, which is helping to provide people, especially high school and college students, with the skills that they need to be as marketable of talent as possible. Um, I'll give you brief details into what my day-to-day -day looks like, one of the programs that I work on is called Code Next. It's actually an after school computer science program where students get to come in and get a free introduction to everything related to computer science from coding in JavaScript to using 3D printers and laser cutters to understanding graphic design and podcasting. And we target specifically black and brown students in the United States because frankly, the tech sector is incredibly marginalized. Last, I think the last stat that I heard was that most tech companies have fewer than 3% of their uh, workforce being either Black or Latino Hispanic. And when you compare those stats to the larger population of the United States, it's just absolutely unmatched and pretty ridiculous and insane. Um, kind of in addition to that, I also had the opportunity to work on Tech Exchange. So Tech Exchange is a program that sort of similar to Code Next is free for students who are in college, but with this concept, we're bringing in college students to the Google offices in Mountain View where they get a three to six month crash course in being in computer software engineering. So we work with lots of different universities from across the community, but specifically, we work with two types of communities in the United States. HBCUs, which stand for Historically Black Colleges and Universities, and HSIs, which are Hispanic Serving Institutions. Both of these systems basically have groups of students that are pursuing computer science as a major, but when they come on campus, what they're getting access to is mentorship, they're getting a chance to actually work next to real Google software engineers. They're getting a chance to work with one another and meet other peers that are interested in the same topics that they're interested in. And so this has actually really been a pretty incredible experience for me because through these two programs, I've come to understand what it really takes to succeed, not just in the tech world, but also from a fundamental just career standpoint in general. I see students that are going to some of the best universities in the country, and I see some of the things that they might be missing because higher education might not necessarily be providing to them everything that they really need to succeed in the working world. And so what I'm going to share a little bit about with you today is what I've observed and also provide some recommendations and pieces of advice 
based on not just my own experiences in my career and with my students, but also from talking to number numerous people at Google that work in human resources, recruiting, um, the computer science departments, UX, all of those places that I see a ton of jobs still popping up each and every day. And again, as I'm going through this, please, please, please feel free to ask questions. So before we get into it, I actually had a little exercise that I'm curious to hear from all of you about. I like doing this when I do these keynotes because I think it's a good idea to self-reflect on what we observe is happening in the IT field and the career world as it applies to us as individuals. So what I'd like you to do in a moment is in the chat, I'd like you to describe whether you agree, disagree, or you're somewhere in the middle in terms of three statements. So this is the first statement. I am fully confident that if I needed to, I could quit my job and get another one within the same field. So I'm gonna give everybody a moment. I'd like you to say whether you really agree, really disagree, or maybe you're somewhere in the middle. So just take a few moments, reflect, and share what you're thinking. Okay, so we've got an agree, agree, agree. All right, lots of agrees. Okay, first, not sure. Appreciate your honesty, Graciela, agree. So for the most part, it seems like most people do agree. Oh, we do have a, a, not another disagree. Interesting. Okay, so that's fascinating. Um, I normally, when I do this, I tend to see folks go more on the agree side. Let's go to the next one. And now let's see what the same response is. If we get a same response or a different response. Now, what about this one? I am confident that I will be able to get and retain a job or jobs with a livable wage for the rest of my life. Do you agree with this? Do you disagree? Or are you somewhere in the middle? So are you confident you will be able to get and retain a job? Okay. Okay, I'm seeing a little bit more variance. I'm seeing a couple of disagrees. Jose says the middle. Another disagree, disagree middle. Okay, so there's a little bit more sort of uncertainty about this one, which is interesting because many of you said that you were confident you could get another job in the same field right now if you quit. But when it comes to confidence around the rest of your life, there's a little bit less so. So now let me ask one last comment. I am confident just ignore one of those that's, I put that in by accident, that if my field became crowded or irrelevant, that I could get a job in a different field. So let's say, for example, you work in construction and construction may not necessarily be relevant because of robotics and deliveries and robotics. What do you think with this one? Do you agree, disagree, or are you somewhere in the middle? Let's give everyone a moment. Okay, so we got one agree. Okay, agree, middle. Another agree, not sure. Agree, middle. And el medio, middle. Okay, so still a little bit more uncertainty than that first one. Not as much uncertainty as the second comment, which is interesting. And what I'm also noticing is that with some of you, you're saying agree to a couple of these, but not necessarily agree to all of them. So while, for example, you may have confidence that you can get another job in your field or even in another field, when it comes to confidence over the rest of your life with a livable wage, that's less certain. So take a minute to just kind of absorb that reality that as much as we feel confident right now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we feel confident along the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years, however long you have before you hopefully get to retire. Though to be honest, for many of us, retirement doesn't necessarily feel like the most achievable dream. So the question is, what do you do? 
So I want to talk a little bit about these three themes. And while I'm discussing this, I'd like you to kind of reflect on your answers from those first three activities that I just had, those comments that I mentioned. So what is the reality of the job market sector right now? What am I noticing as someone who works at Google, as someone who works in the tech field, but also as someone who reviews a lot of research about these job markets? Then we're going to talk a little bit about, okay, based on that reality, what does that mean for us as employees, as entrepreneurs, as folks who want to maintain that livable wage? And then last but not least, how do you prepare for jobs of the future? Are there things that I've noticed that do seem to support people as they're going through the ups and the downs of economic turmoil and change? And as certain job um, areas tend to become more popular and certain job areas tend to be either going down in popularity or end up becoming replaced. Now, I think one of the most important things we have to talk about when we're talking about the reality of today's job markets is this comment here. 65% of jobs that young people will have don't exist yet. The job that I am currently in at Google did not exist 10 years ago. And what's interesting about that is that that's just as relevant towards continuing adult education with folks like yourselves as it is to anybody else. Um, I don't know if anybody recognizes this man. If you do, um, throw his name in the comments. Let's see if anybody, anybody know who he is? Okay. So this is Dr. Michu Kaku. He's a very famous um, American scientist, philosopher, and commentator. And he is a, a person who's come into play a lot more in terms of talking about how the internet is eventually going to be everywhere and nowhere. Now, when he says this, what he means is the internet of things. The idea that the internet is becoming so omnipresent in our lives, it's helping the way we transport things, it's helping the way we interact with each other, it's even helping the way we learn, that understanding how relevant the internet is in all elements of our life, including our working worlds, is crucial. But here's the thing. People tend to get a little bit nervous about this to the point of feeling like I'm just going to be replaced by technology and the internet. Um, a lot of folks in the United States, and this is true for many South, America, South American and um, Caribbean and Central American countries as well, talk a lot about how robotics is replacing a number of um, industries that have become some of the most um, the most common for folks to have a, a wage to live. The one that I see a lot of is trucking. The idea of truckers who physically transport things from one end of a country to another may be replaced by robotics someday. As many of you probably know, there are a number of companies that are working on this, Google included. Many years ago, Google acquired Waymo and Waymo is attempting to create a self-driving car. Same thing with the Tesla, same thing with a number of other tech companies. It is a reality that people start to get concerned about. And you know, you do see somewhat of um, more, I would say incendiary or like, ah, kind of titles like this one, robots may steal as many as 800 million jobs in the next 13 years. And so as a result, people tend to go straight to this idea of like, oh boy, do I need to immediately be able to, you know, create robots? Is that the thing that I need to get into? A lot of folks start to think, okay, it's time for me to learn how to code. I need to be a software engineer. I need to, you know, understand information systems. I need to be the next person who's going to create the next Tesla, the next Facebook, the next Oracle. This is something that I hear a lot. I get pings on LinkedIn probably at least two to three times a day from folks asking me, what do you recommend I do to prepare for my next job, to get into another sector? How can I get to Google? All right, well, I'm here to break a little bit of reality to you, which is that there are actually three times more tech jobs for non-coders than for programmers. So let me just <laughs> say that one more time. There are three times more tech jobs for non-coders than for programmers. So what this means is you don't necessarily need to be an expert when it comes to computer science to get into the technical field. So let me give you a little bit of background into this. So a couple of years ago, 
Break Into Tech, who is a research institution who I mentioned on the last slide, did this massive survey of several Fortune 500 companies across the globe. They were trying to get an idea of how many technical versus non-technical roles exist in the world. And, you know, this was in 2016, but the truth of the matter is, is this hasn't really changed all that dramatically. So here's where the technical roles came into play. Of these 500, Fortune 500 companies, they had the largest number in IT, information technology. They then had a number in engineering, operations that were technical in nature, and quality assurance. And quality assurance also oftentimes does require some sort of technical background. So the total of this number of jobs was about 140,000. Now that's a big number, but by comparison, they also asked about non-technical roles. And you'll notice that the total at the bottom is almost $400,000. So let's take a look at some of these roles. So one thing that's really interesting is that entrepreneurship is right up at the top because a lot of organizations are looking for people that can come in and be, you know, the folks that are coming up with new ideas and coming up with new strategies and figuring out how to take the company forward. But then as you go down the line, you realize, wow, there's a ton of non-technical job spaces that frankly, I didn't realize until I got to Google and started meeting all of these non-technical people. Um, my partner actually does sales for another technical organization named Checker, which is a background check software company based in the Bay Area. And sales is something that is huge. In fact, before I ended up hopping on this keynote, he was like, tell everybody that you're talking to that customer success is a really great space to go into. I'll get into that a little bit later when I talk about my recommendations for teachers looking to go into tech, but I'll get to that. But I mean, look at all of the different industries we have in here. We have marketing, we have arts, we have media, support. This is where a lot of like, you know, sort of roles kind of like customer success will come into play. Customer support, customer success. We have consulting, business development. One of the ones that I think is really interesting is human resources. Human resources is absolutely crucial for all of these companies, especially Fortune 500 companies to be successful because HR is so important for once your organization hits this level of you know, just enough people that you do need to start thinking about professional development and benefits and helping people continue their progress through the organization. But then you also have accounting, you have legal, real estate. I work with a huge real estate team at Google. They're always helping us to find new locations for our Code Next labs where the kids come after school. I love our real estate folks. But a lot of these people don't come from a technical background. They're experts in each of these fields. And as a result, they're able to come in and contribute what they know really well, which a lot of these Fortune 500 companies really need. So what does that mean for us? I want to talk a little bit about what I see as sort of the major areas for development in terms of your skill sets. And then also I'm gonna talk a little bit about how I think we can get there. So when it comes to the programming that I run at Google, but this is very common to be honest for a lot of um, professional development that Google tends to run for adults that both work in Google and out of Google, there's three major areas that you need to learn to always be developing. There's hard skills, there's soft skills, and then this last thing, social capital, which I'll get to in a moment. For some of you, you may think, okay, hard skills, I kind of know what that is. That's like coding, right? But it's actually more than coding. It's not just coding. There's a number of different hard skills that frankly can play a huge role in what you do and what you can contribute to an organization. So we're talking accounting, we're talking finance, we're talking writing, legal, speaking of foreign language, web design, typing. So one thing I will say is, you know, I do observe that sometimes when computer software engineers come into Google, they don't necessarily progress through Google because they're lacking in a different department like writing. It's amazing how much being able to write a strong email can make or break whether somebody gets an interview. 
You know, if you're emailing with a Google recruiter and the writing in your email isn't very strong, that's a big red flag for a lot of Google recruiters. They make a note of that. So hard skills, yes, for tech. Sometimes computer programming is a major part of that. But that's not necessarily always the case, though, if you are interested in programming, I did want to mention that, you know, there are a lot of job openings that are coming. So Fast Company in 2016, for example, mentioned that there were 7 million job openings that required coding skills and that programming jobs overall were growing faster than the market average. This is an important thing to be aware of, but like I mentioned before, this isn't the be all end all. And also when you're talking about coding, I think it's important that people recognize that it's not just one type of coding. You're talking about either front end, back end, or a combo of the two skill sets. Front end is you know, the web development. That's the stuff that the user actually sees when they log on to your site. But the back end stuff, that's actually where I think a lot of the real magic happens because the back end software is really what enables something to run so completely. I mean, there are a number of back end engineers that are making sure that every part of Google is consistently running successfully. And I will say that cloud is huge now. Every major tech company has some sort of cloud commitment. Apple has one, Google has one, Microsoft has one, Dropbox has one. With everybody trying to figure out what data storage looks like in that giant, you know, internet of things, as Michio Kaku refers to it as, the cloud computing world is growing immensely. And I, my observation at Google is that cloud computing is where we do see a lot of growth happening, especially on the Google cloud team specifically. But it's not just about hard skills. So the second group that I want to talk about is soft skills. Now, Sometimes when I talk to folks, they're like, yeah, 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 soft skills, whatever. Okay, let me make it clear. Every year, the World Economic, uh, sorry, every year, every two years, three years, every couple of years, uh, the World Economic Forum, which is a massive think tank, puts out the Future of Jobs report. And what they do is they always tend to look at what the top 10 soft skills are that employers are requesting. So we're not just talking about like, skill sets that, you know, are nice to have. They're actual things that employers are saying, this is what we're looking for in the people that are interviewing. In the future of jobs report, the World Economic Forum does a really great job of reminding folks like five years ago what the top 10 skills were versus now. So the most recent one I reviewed in 2020 had a really interesting change in what these folks tend to be looking for. At the very top is complex problem solving. That continues to be the number one thing that folks are requesting. And a lot of times when you're in an interview at these major Fortune 500 companies, they're going to ask you to solve a problem, but they want you to work through all of the different steps. They'll say, okay, you know, this is a situation we're having right now. How would you solve this? Please take me through each individual step so I understand how you get from the problem to your proposed solution. However, there's certain things that have also kind of started to tick up the ladder. Critical thinking was number four in 2015, but man, that has really come up to 2020. And COVID just made this all the more important because critical thinking on a quick basis is something that was so needed when massive issues like COVID took place and just affected everybody. Creativity went from 10 to three. This is something that I see a lot of. It's not enough for you to come in and just push a red button anymore. They want you to come in and be able to do that complex problem solving, but have a lot of creative energy with it. Now notice what started to drop down. So negotiation, negotiation has actually started to drop further down. Coordinating with others is still relatively high. It's still in the top five, but then one that's popped on here that I actually really wanna point out is this one, emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is something that has quickly become a much, much, much more requested skill set. There's something that someone said to me years ago, which has always stuck with me, which is hard skills get you a job, soft skills take you to the top. And I fundamentally agree with that because what I've noticed at Google is sometimes you get super technical folks, they come in, they know HTML, they know JavaScript, they know Python. They can create things, but when it comes to interacting with other team members 
and problem solving together and collaborating, if they're lacking the emotional intelligence to know how to interact with other folks and make them feel safe and validated, but also challenge them, oftentimes a lack of those skills means that they're not going to get promoted. They're not going to be getting the raises. They're not going to be getting the, the accolades that may retain them at an organization. And frankly, that's something that I think we're starting to really kind of recognize more and more frequently. This is also true in the virtual landscape. Um, virtual emotional intelligence is something I won't talk a little bit about today, but I highly encourage you to research it because there were a lot of studies done during COVID that talked a lot about what it means to be emotionally intelligent in a virtual setting in comparison with a live setting. There are some similarities, but virtual emotional intelligence is a bit unique in the sense that, you know, when I am on a screen paying attention to somebody trying to both deal with, you know, intermittent Wi-Fi while also trying to have some sort of conversation, there's different skill sets you have to consider. And that's something that I think a lot of folks are still trying to wrap their heads around. We're all better probably than we were two years ago because of COVID, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Now, my personal favorite thing to talk about is social capital. Um, right now, I'm getting my part-time doctorate at UCLA in educational leadership, and the topic of my dissertation is social capital development. So what is social capital? When you're talking about being in a working environment, social capital are the different relationships you have that have economic benefits. And what I mean by that is that if you have colleagues or peers or mentors who not only can work with you on things in your workplace, but also have accesses to resources or funding that you don't have access to, you have capital based on just that relationship because they make it easier for you to acquire those resources than if you didn't have that relationship. In my line of work, I've noticed that throughout my career, I've had a lot of different groups in my world that have helped me get jobs. You know, my Harvard community, when I got my master's at Harvard, has been incredibly fruitful for me getting speaking engagements, being able to like actually find folks that I bring on to my team at Google. But that's just one small part of it. You know, going to ed tech meetups in the Bay Area has been huge. I used to work for the Catholic school system in Los Angeles. I did this huge trip to Israel where I met a bunch of entrepreneurs in the Israeli government. And that was really interesting because I met a lot of folks that if I ever wanted to pursue more um, uh, non-US opportunities, there are those connections there. And so I do want to make it very clear that, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can meet folks and connect. And, you know, when I talk to teachers, I usually like to remind them, you know, that their fellow teachers, maybe classmates from when they were in school, those can play a huge role. But the ones on the right are also really important. So social media is a prime example. Social media is a place that I know for many of us, it can be a little overwhelming. People aren't always the nicest online, but at the same time, I have met more folks on LinkedIn and they've met me than ever before. In fact, I remember there was a young student who was doing a research pro project where he wanted to understand like how different women got into tech. So he just contacted me. He said, hey, I'd like to meet you for 15 to 20 minutes interview you for my research project. I did. And truthfully, we ended up talking way longer than 15 to 20 minutes. And I, I saw that there was a lot of amazing kind of talent behind just this research project he was doing. So I ended up referring him for a job at a tech company and now he's in that job. So, you know, it's amazing how you can really create these connections. And of course there's things like coaches and mentors, but also friends and family can play a huge role. Um, and those are usually sometimes the places that we go first, but I don't want to discount that because, you know, oftentimes we may feel like, oh, you know, I, I need to go find other connections, but also think about who is already in your network. You may find that people have more contacts than you realize. You just have to ask. So I want to make sure that we have enough time for questions at the end. So I want to talk a little bit then about really the third component of this, which are my recommendations around preparing for jobs of the future. So remember about 20 minutes ago, I asked you, do you feel like you could get another job in your field? Do you feel like you could get another job in a different field? And do you feel like you can have enough 
for a livable wage for the rest of your life. There was definitely more hesitancy about the livable wage for the rest of your life component, which I think is kind of not surprising. Um, there's oftentimes a question of what's gonna happen in the future, what jobs are going to be relevant, what industries may become overcome, what industries will go through changes. That means that new jobs are kicked out or old jobs are kicked out and new jobs come in. The truth of the matter is, is that nobody can predict the future. We never know exactly what's going to happen. I can't predict the future five years from now, 10 years from now, 100 years from now. But what I can do is I can offer some pieces of advice that have worked for me or worked for colleagues or worked in the greater tech sector as things that I think you should consider using as opportunities to keep yourself as ready and as adaptable as possible. So first off, as basic as this sounds, I want to make sure that I say it loud and clear. I want everyone to stay committed to being a lifelong learner. This has become a very common concept in education these days, the idea of being a lifelong learner. But I'm a little bit more targeted in that. And what I mean is, as much as maybe it's good to learn about things that you're familiar with and like stay up to date, I also think you should really learn about things you're not as comfortable with or not as aware of. Um, one way that I love doing that is I use a tool called TweetDeck. So I'm very active on Twitter. I find Twitter to be one of the best opportunities for professional development, but frankly, there's a lot of other opportunities out there on other platforms. You know, there are discords that you can communicate with, but TweetDeck to me is amazing. And I'll tell you why. When you have TweetDeck open, you can set hashtags for whatever topic you're learning about. And every time somebody tweets with that hashtag, it comes through the system. So every once in a while, when I'm looking to learn about something in particular, like maybe I'm learning about you know, artificial intelligence, that's something I really wanna know about. I'll go ahead and I'll start a new tweet deck list and I'll do hashtag artificial intelligence. And what it does is it not only introduces me to maybe new content, but it also introduces me to new people who are experts in their own right. So some of my favorite folks that I found on Twitter who have taught me a lot about new industries, I've tracked through TweetDeck. And it can be a little overwhelming. So I want to, you know, make sure everybody knows, like, this is not something that you have to engage with every day. If you're the type of person who would rather just honestly read a book, go for it. The fact is, as long as you're learning, you're learning. But for me, TweetDeck is something that I found very inviting. I've met a lot of people through this. And honestly, that'll kind of pull into play something that I'll talk about in a few minutes around that social capital piece and how to um, build your network a little bit more. Now, what about the second thing? Well, reflect on your skills and how they translate. So I think a lot of times people will say to me, oh, you know, you did such a smart thing. You know, you were a teacher, but then you got a degree in education technology. And so people see you have your master's and they like, that, that means that they trust you. They, they trust that you have the skill set. <laughs> I'll be the first one to tell you, I don't always think that higher education is the most fruitful when it comes to teaching anybody anything, but that's a separate conversation that we don't have to go into. I think that a lot of times when you want to transition into a new space or into a new role, it's as much about how you tell your story and how you describe your skills and how they translate as much as it is having the skills themselves. And I don't mean you don't have skills, but let me give you an example. So about five years ago, I wrote this story for Ed Surge, the news organization I used to work for, because I was getting a lot of questions from teachers around going into the tech field. And I'm gonna use this as an example. But even if you're not in education, I think that there's a relevance here in terms of how you think about like what is on your resume and how you describe it as how it fits into a different industry. So in the last couple of years, actually, I'll show you this, you know, one of the most fruitfully increasing industries in terms of um, salary are product management, data science, designing and software engineering. Um, Two of these are more tactical product management, I kind of feel like is not as tactical because it usually refers to more like organizing a team around as developing a product. Data science can be somewhat technical. Designing kind of is a little bit of both left brain and right brain. Um, 
But when I talk to teachers, I'm like, okay, so let's think about what you do right now and how you could potentially argue that you are doing basically the same thing, but just in a different industry. So maybe you enjoy working with teams, you know, working with team members, guiding people, leading them. That's a huge part of what a product manager does. A lot of educators are very very good at developing tests or assessments. When you're a teacher, you honestly feel like your job is about tracking data. And so many times I think to myself, teachers are really great at data science. That's something that they can do bar none. And then for the designing piece, I've seen some educators make some of the most creative lesson plans I've ever seen in my life. They create their own graphics. They create really incredible decks that have just amazing design and animation. And I think, yo, Designing is definitely where you want to go. But the reason I say this is because honestly, most of the time, things that you've done in your existing job can directly relate to roles in the tech space. So I kind of organized, you know, things that I had done when I was a teacher from a more analytical standpoint to a more interpersonal standpoint. Uh, analytical is kind of more like you know, what about how you organize and design and logistics, whereas interpersonal is a bit more about like interacting with folks. So the product management one is a little kind of of both, but that's okay. But so I sort of said, all right, if you're really into test and assessment design, product management might be for you. Maybe you're into data tracking, R&D, lesson and unit plan design, curriculum, presenting and instruction, great for sales and marketing. If you're really good at presenting a concept to somebody, sales and marketing is for you. Or leading grade level teams, a lot of times there's these sort of customer success roles. And so I think that that makes sense for what people go into. And I want to go back to what I said before about my fiance, who actually works in customer success. His biggest piece of advice to give everybody here is most people are really good at customer success because if you work in any capacity where you are interacting with other human beings and you're doing a task for them or you're you know helping to translate concepts for them or you know you're you're teaching them in some capacity it might not be a middle school student but maybe you're you know training people on the job customer success is a great and easy way to get into tech. It's something also that is so fundamental to a tech company's success because oftentimes customer success or customer service is something that the user is interacting with. You're basically the first line of defense that a company has. You're the person that the user becomes most comfortable with. And so when I think about if I were to go back in time and I wanted to go into tech without getting a a degree, a master's degree, I probably would have gone that direction because I like talking to people. And frankly, it's easy to sort of be like, look, I work with students all the time. I teach them. I can do the same thing for adults. Let me show you how. Now, last but not least, and I think this goes without saying, but I'm gonna give you some tactical pieces of advice to help you with this, is developing those networks. Um, you, You may have heard a phrase a la something like, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I'll give you just, you know, I'll tell you straight up at Google, people refer candidates a lot. And the Google human resources team does put a lot of stake on if an internal Googler refers that person. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a super strong relationship. It doesn't necessarily mean that that person has to have known you for years, but if they can even just get your name onto the desk of a recruiter, that right there is already giving you a leg up over someone else that just applied through the online system. One thing I really like is I've noticed that there are more and more organizations that are popping up to help people create and engage in these small communities, small networks over common ground. Um, I was just researching a couple of days ago to see what's new. Um, And there was this one site I found called Stereotype Breakers, which is an organization that's intended to help women in tech meet each other. And they actually have an application for their Discord community. So Discord has become sort of like the new Slack. Um, For those of you who use Slack, you know, it was basically an online tool where you get to meet other people. A A lot of times companies will use it internally. Maybe some of you use it. 
But Discord has become almost like the version of Slack that's just open to everybody. Um, some of them will be closed like this community, but if you just go online and just type like Discord community women in tech, it's amazing the things that you'll see pop up because people just want to get to know other people. Um, if you're interested in applying for the Stereotype Breakers Discord community, you just have to go to their site, uh, stereotypebreakers.com slash community and fill it out. I'm pretty sure that they're pretty open to having folks come in, including, um, you know, folks that may not necessarily be super well versed in tech, but want to get to know more about it. Um, but it's definitely something worth checking out because I think they're also looking to diversify their community across the globe. They want women who are interested in tech from all over the community, all over the world. Um, because the, you know, the larger that your networks get, the more opportunity you have to potentially gain access to these companies. And sort of in conjunction with this, there are more and more company roles now that are remote at Google than I've ever seen before. You know, back in my day when I applied for the first job in 2017, I really was like, well, I guess I'm going to have to stay in the Bay in San Francisco for a lot longer because Google wants me here. COVID happened, and now Google's a lot more sort of open to having remote workers. In fact, I actually moved to Los Angeles about four months ago because I didn't need to be in the Bay anymore. My work doesn't necessarily require me to be physically present. And so the thing I like about these communities as well is you're meeting people who are in different places who may know organizations that you've never heard of because you may not be from that country or that city. And we're no longer in an environment where you're necessarily always required to come in live. So there's been no better time than the present to engage with folks and meet from all over the world. So I highly encourage you to get more invested in that. Now, the last thing I'll say is this, and then I know that we're um, almost at the 50 mark. No, we can have been at Google now for five years. I love working there. I love the people that I'm with, but I also realize that it is really hard to get in, a foot in the door because there's just so many people who are applying each and every day. I think the last I checked, it was, you know, like 0.2% applications. Um, if you are interested in getting a referral, please don't hesitate to let me know because at this point, I, I feel like it's really just a game and you just have to know the players to play the game. And so if you are interested in applying for a role, I will be happy to refer you. Just send me your resume, send me some information and let me know what job you're interested in, in going for. Um, other companies, Apple, Oracle, you know, a lot of them function similarly. For smaller organizations, I would say it's less about a referral process and it's more about maybe meeting with somebody who works there you know, kind of indicating that you're interested and then giving them the opportunity to, you know, maybe talk to their boss on your behalf. It's a bit more word of mouth, not necessarily as kind of like um, step by step as big companies like Google are. But I do think that the network piece is something that really can't go without really dismissing because it is true that I got, one of the reasons I was able to get my job at Google was because a friend of mine from my master's program made a recommendation for me and that got my foot in the door. The other thing I'll say is that if you are ever interested in switching to a new industry or a new community or a new type of job, don't apply just once. One thing about Google I think a lot of people don't know is that most of the people that work there probably went through the process of applying at least two or three times. My manager, PETA, She's one of the greatest people I've ever met. She had to apply a total of four times until she finally got a gig. Four times. And it was over a two-year period. So don't lose faith. And if it is something that you're interested in, I say go for it. But also, I think that these are good practices, even if you're not looking for a new role, if you're just looking to understand how tech is affecting what we're doing as human beings. If you're trying to just widen your networks because you'd like to meet new people, I highly recommend checking out the different tools and um, pieces of tech that I recommended because frankly, the world is just becoming more and more of a complex place. And the more you do a job of trying to understand it and meet other people, the better in the long run, not just for you as a lifelong learner, but also for your sustainability as a professional. 
And with that, I'm going to bring my uh, conversation to a close. And so what I think we'd like to do now is open it up for questions. Is that right? Yeah, maybe. And I think that the way we're doing- um, Mary Jo, oh, yeah. um, we have one question. Okay. Um, what? Um, it's, it's in English, so I'm gonna read it in English. Sure. Is this true for all countries, regardless of development level? And then I clar uh, clarifies the non-technical jobs. Hmm. Okay, so let's go back. Actually, I want to show my slide on the um, on the non-technical jobs for a second because I do want to clarify that first of all, these Fortune 500 companies were everywhere. Um, they weren't just in the United States. They were literally from everywhere. So I think that's important to recognize is that these are, these are jobs that aren't just um, focused on the U.S. economy. In terms of development versus non-development, I do think that uh, um, more developed countries, it's a little bit easier to suggest that these types of roles are available. However, these roles do exist in non-developed countries as well. Um, I think they're a little bit less maybe broken up as like distinctly as they are on this list. I mean, this list really goes into very specific groups. Um, you know, you may, for example, find that there are roles in arts and design that also blend together marketing and media and communication, but you will find these types of jobs anywhere because the reality is, is that the best organization in any in any space, not just necessarily tech or IT, is going to need someone to sell, someone to market, someone to help with, you know, conducting growth research, someone to deal with all the, you know, legal and accounting stuff. These are things that have existed in business success since the beginning of time. So you will always be able to find roles like this. Um, and I personally think that one of the best ways to just get an idea is to go on any local jobs board that exists in the country where you are, type in each of these different terms and see the number of jobs that pop up around where you are. You know, if you're in Argentina or if you're in Costa Rica or if you're in, you know, um, I don't know, really anywhere, whatever local job site is the one that you use, type in one of these topics and I guarantee you'll see some of these topics come up. Some of these jobs do end up becoming more relevant during certain times of economic downturn than others. Um, I will say sales, for example, has a huge uptick during moments like this, where you know the economy tends to be a little bit less powerful, at least in the US right now, we're seeing a bit of an economic downturn. I've noticed that sales jobs have gone up, human resources jobs recruiting have gone down because there's less of a need for human resource recruiters to find IT people. The sales folks though, however, need to bring in the money. So as a result, you know, you may find that some of these do tend to pop up more or less depending on what time of year or what the current state of economic affairs is in, in the country that you live in. Yeah. I think I saw another chat pop up, which let me see. Okay, here we go. So I see. Um, um, yes, we have uh, some more questions here in the chat. Yep. Um, Juan Crespo is asking, what can you advise to IT people who is little shy or not very comfortable to speak with no IT people? So <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I think that there actually, there are some really great ways to kind of practice. Personally, to me, shyness is oftentimes much easier to deal with if you're engaging with somebody in an online setting. Um, I actually think that joining discords for folks who are shy is an amazing resource because if you're the type of person that gets nervous around talking to folks in person, the digital landscape for networking is 100% your call. And it gives you the opportunity to also kind of like practice networking without necessarily having to engage face to face. Um, in, in terms of IT people talking to non IT people, what I will say is that I, I've heard from software engineers at Google that sometimes they get frustrated because when they talk to non-IT people, they're like, why don't they just understand what I'm talking about? 
And I think we just all have to be a little bit nicer to each other. I like to consider that when I'm talking to somebody who's not an expert, I use it as an opportunity to, for myself to practice how I explain like what I do or my expertise to a person who's not necessarily an expert to see how good I am at actually like explaining it to, you know, someone who may not necessarily know as much as I do. Um, but I highly recommend Discord, highly recommend checking out Twitter, highly recommend TweetDeck. I think that for, for folks that get nervous around networking, the internet and manners of networking on the internet, that is definitely the place for you to really practice and then get a little bit more comfortable just being in person. So, yeah. I think I see a question further down. Can I try to a job in Brazil speaking Portuguese? I think this is a question. Um, uh, yes, we have um, we have a comment. Okay. Oh. Yes, go ahead. Uh, puedo probar un trabajo. Can I try to a job in Brazil speaking Portuguese? So we do have jobs in Brazil, I believe, where Portuguese is the main language. Um, one thing that I have. I'm not as familiar with the Google Brazil office, but I am more familiar with the Google Argentina office. And I know that oftentimes they do prefer that someone has at least a working knowledge of English. However, there are many jobs where you might be speaking Portuguese or might be speaking Spanish. In fact, in Miami, for example, many of the sales people in the Miami office speaking Spanish or another language is a requirement because oftentimes they're going to be working with potential clients who only speak Spanish or prefer to speak in Spanish. In Brazil, it's kind of the same thing. If you go into sales, they're going to ask that you do speak some English for more of like a cross-country Google internal work, but then for the sales work, speaking Portuguese or speaking Spanish is crucial. Um, now for more IT jobs, that I'm not as sure about. I think it varies on where you are. So if you're in Brazil and you're working on a team that is largely made of folks from Brazil, that may mean that you can actually speak Portuguese more with your team. So I think it's kind of more on the nature of the job. But if you check the jobs board, it should specify either what languages are required or what languages are preferred. Um, Okay, so I see that you're a senior network engineer. So you're studying English. I think that's great. You do not have to be completely fluent to be able to get a job at Google in English. I mean, I, I work with someone who actually is from Argentina originally and his English is okay. I think that he would like to be better, but the reality is, is that he's running our Latino Hispanic employee resource group at Google. And so being able to speak in Spanish and in Portuguese is actually almost of more importance than being fluent in English. So I think it just depends on the role that you're looking at. Now, outside of Google, I'm not, I can't necessarily speak to other companies, but there are a lot of companies now that are either opening offices in various South American, Central American, Caribbean countries, or you know, are potentially hiring folks that are remote. So even if there isn't an office, but you get a remote job, you know, they may be able to work with you on that. So my recommendation is read the job description and when in doubt, if you're able to figure out who the recruiter is for the role, which some job descriptions will include who the recruiter is, send them a note and just check in and ask and see what they say. And I will say most times the interviews do tend to be in English. So that is one thing to be aware of is if you are going to apply for a job, even if the job might be, you know, more focused on Spanish or Portuguese, you probably will be interviewing with at least one to two fluent English speakers from the United States, just because so many of the jobs are connected to teams that reside in the United States. Um, okay, and then I see Pora Hemplo. Let me see. Okay, I want to see if I can get this question. I think this means can you work at Google completely online? Um, yes. Maybe I can read it. Sure. Se puede trabajar en Google de manera totalmente online como el área de soporte. Can you work in Google totally online? For example, in support. Can you hear Mary Jo? The question is I'm going to read the question again. For example, can you get a job in Google to work totally online, for example, in support? Thank you. So, yes, you can work completely at Google online. Um, when we went 
from when, when COVID kind of started to get dealt with and we went from non COVID times to kind of like now people are vaccinated, being able to go back into the office. Um, Google gave people the option to apply to be fully remote. And I think about 10% of the, co the company asked to be fully remote. So as a result, I think that there's a bit a big uptick in the number of jobs that are also remote. Um, it's not all of them. A number of jobs are still live and a number of jobs still require you to come into the office, but a number of more jobs than before have been said, okay, yes, this can be remote. The other thing I'll say is that, you know, if you're more concerned about just coming into the office five days a week, we are only required to come into the office between two and three days. I spend most of my time working from home on Mondays and Fridays, and I go into the office Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So there is a lot more flexibility than there used to be. And this is true for the entire tech sector. Frankly, I would say that I wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years, Google allows everybody to you know, go virtual three days a week instead of two. So I think that we're starting to see you know, a bit more trending towards a truly hybrid workforce. All right, and I guess that's my time. Thank you, everyone. I really enjoyed being here. Should I turn it back over to uh, you guys, Claire and Alessia? Thank you, Mary, for for well, for um, for your for answering our questions and for your speech. Um, uh, I'm going to to finish uh, because we don't have any more questions. And in in case anyone has any more questions, uh, you can contact us or add Mary to Twitter. Yes, please do. In fact, here is my Twitter handle. So there you go. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Thank you, everyone.